folks, and welcome back to twitch.tv slash gameswithnick. Gonna have a uh, quick and dirty stream. Uh, I really just want to wrap up this, uh, this game. We only have about half hour left, I think, so. Well, half hour plus the denouement. This might be interesting. After its triumphant tour on three continents, Fairfax Theater Company is pleased to present the exclusive world premiere of Vagrancy and Profligacy by S. Prescott, with Catherine Small and Rayleigh Wilcox, staged by the author, company author, company director, Dwight Richards. Aston's Theatre, here we are. We are not open to the public yet, gentlemen. Oh, bless my soul. I can hardly believe my eyes. It is the young Sherlock Holmes, isn't it? Watson, allow me to present Philotomy Kirvin, who in his day was one of the last great hopes of the popular stage. He also took great pains to advance my comprehension of the many subtleties of the theatrical arts. So he can still prattle away. Don't listen to him. This is the most talented student I've ever met, upon my word, as an actor. But those days are past. So, am I speaking to the former actor or the world-renowned detective today? Tell me, what you know about the Fairfax Theatre Troupe? Two months ago, they returned from an international tour. Richards, their director, had managed to secure the necessary funds to buy back Aston's. It seems he had finally resolved his troubles. He was in some kind of trouble. Oh, bah. It's always the same with those tours abroad. Your star actress marries an emir. Another time the entire troupe has their luggage stolen. Anything is possible. And whatever occurs is usually nothing good. But who would have imagined such a tragedy? Am I going to have to grab every word out of your mouth with a pincer, huh? What tragedy? Their last tour started about three years ago. At that time, the troupe was housed at the Fairfax Theatre. But a series of failures forced the owners to sell it at a substantial loss. The owners were three individuals. Dwight Richards, their current director, Miss Davenport, their star actress, and the mistress of Richards, and lastly, a young actor, costumier, makeup man called Jeffries. They decided, after the sale, to launch an international tour in order to raise funds. Their success was assured? Yes. The fame of English theatre is worldwide. During their travels, Jeffries and Miss Davenport developed a close relationship. Ooh. Much to the regret of the hot-headed Richards. He is a gypsy by birth. That doesn't mean anything. No can be more possessive and quick-tempered. Also, I apologize for the racial slur that is gypsy. In short, a dark tragedy occurred in a village in Latin America, located not far from the Amazon. One evening, after their performance, someone noticed that Miss Davenport and Jeffreys had gone missing. The local authorities were notified, and the alarm was raised. And Richards? Richards was implicated in some manner, it seems to me. However, there was no proof of his involvement, and no bodies were ever found. What a strange case. If you need more details, you should ask the actors. As you may observe, they are rarely able to hold their tongues. I'll All right. see you later, Kirby. Yes, it was good seeing you again. Bye. Let's go this way, I guess. You, young man, what do you have to say? Hello, young man, what are you looking at? Oh, I'm sorry, you startled me. I'm looking at her. Her. 
are you from the press? Of course you are. You must be here to interview her. Oh, the play is wonderful, and Miss Caroline will surely shine. If only my father could have seen this day. Who's your father? Your father? Yes, I am Bruce Aston, and my father was Clyde Aston, the former owner of the theatre. It may have fallen into some disrepair, but during its time it was well loved by so many. A host of young actors debuted on that venerated stage. Why, it was at this very spot where Mr. Richards first met Miss Davenport. Have you ever heard of the Fairfax Theatre? It is the theatre which was demolished. It seems to me that it had been owned by Mr. Richards together with Miss Davenport and a friend of theirs. They left on an extended tour, but I think it went badly for them. After his return, Mr. Richards bought the theatre back from the bank, and I do hope his good fortune will continue. Well, we can hope. With the talented Miss Caroline, I think anything is possible. And the building is still solid and comfortable. Though the bank took over the theatre, they left the keys. From time to time, I would do what I could to tidy up a bit or see to a broken window. Are you a part of the troupe? Yes. When Mr. Richards noticed how I had worked to keep the place up, he hired me. I helped Mr. Kirby a little, and also Mr. Trumpet backstage. All right. Goodbye, young man. Goodbye, sir. How about you? What do you have to say? Excuse me, may I ask you some questions? Naturally, I'm listening to you. You are rehearsing at the moment, aren't you? Yes, we are in rehearsal for the play we are to perform at the month end. Are you critics or reporters? As you know, we just came back from an extended tour. We were a triumph everywhere we performed. Tell us about this international tour. We performed in France, in Switzerland, and even for an Arab prince. We were met with acclaim at every stop. If tragedy had not occurred, we were to appear next in New York. But fate had other plans for us. What sort of tragedy? Oh, surely you must have heard about it. All because of those in our company who assume the right to reveal every distasteful and intimate detail of a most tragic event. Anything to gain publicity for themselves. It is positively scandalous. But even a professional actor such as myself respects the privileges of the press and the public's right to know. Your sensitivity honours you. Please, continue your story. The event took place in a most sordid place in Brazil, named Guacamole or Babiamo or oh something God, like that. Oh, God, Guacamole. I still can't stop asking myself what we were doing there in the first place. But to be brief, our talented costumier, Mr. Jeffries, had been having a tete-a-tete -tete with the beautiful Miss Davenport. Unfortunately, she was still very much the mistress of our director, Mr. Richards. I tell you, the tension was unbearable. Really? I don't love how much of a caricature of a gay man this person is, but what can you do? Miss Davenport was spending the whole day closeted in her room. Mr. Jeffries trembled so uncontrollably that he was unable to do our makeup. Mr. Richards stepped in, and I must say, he was a pitiful substitute. May you never be so ill-fortunate as to have your face in his large, hairy hands. And then? Our first performance in that town was naturally well received. That very night, a tragedy took place. Mr. Jeffries and Miss Davenport went missing not long after the performance ended. It was impossible to find them. Then, we heard that Mr. Richards was arrested on suspicion of murder regarding Miss Davenport and Mr. Jeffries. We were outraged and most indignant. Some entertained thoughts that we would never leave that godforsaken place. How is the matter resolved? 
Fortunately for Mr. Richards and all of us, the prison warden and the local chief of police was an Englishman. Lacking direct evidence or even a corpse, the accusations against Mr. Richards could not stand. He was set free on the spot. I think that had it not been for the intervention of that young expatriate, we might have been stranded in that Amazonian swamp for all eternity. Hmm. Prison warden was an Englishman, huh? Assistance. Good to know. All right. Don't hesitate to seek my help. <laughs> Don't listen to that milk toast. He gets positively weak in the knees over records. A policeman is just a policeman. That's it. If Richards isn't in jail, it's only because he had nothing to do there. We were talking about the tragedy which occurred during your previous tour, and... You are the press, are you? No. In my opinion, you seem more like policemen. Well, listen closely, inspectors. Miss Davenport was nothing more than an aging woman who adored seeing all the men at her feet. What? Don't you mean... She toyed with both Richards and Jeffreys like two little puppets. Dwight Richards is quick-tempered, but he wouldn't harm a hair on her head. And if you are eager to be so helpful, please, find my red-haired wig. We must continue our investigation. Of course, of course. Can I climb on top of the stage? No, I can just talk to this person. Hello, miss. I'm sorry for disturbing you. Oh, you are welcome. Are you rehearsing the new play? Yes, we are hard at work. Excuse me, did I just hear Mr. Kirby calling you Holmes? Is it really possible that you were the great detective, Sherlock Holmes? And you were Dr. Watson? Forgive an admiring expert, but your earring is absolutely magnificent. Oh, that was a gift from Veronica. She got it along with two other matching earrings and a small jewel case. She gave me this one, another to Doris, and kept the most beautiful for herself. Veronica insisted on cleansing it herself weekly with a special cleanser. It was remarkable and kept the earring all sparkling like stars. And when I saw her last, Veronica was wearing her earring. She never parted with it. I'm investigating the facts of the terrible events that occurred during the company's last tour. Oh, I see. You were interested in that case. It's still a complete mystery, even for those who were there. Tell us about Miss Davenport. She was fabulous and positively mesmerised men. She confessed to me that she had been indiscreet with our costumier, Jeffries. She had left Richards before, but she always came back to him. She said he understood her completely without her even saying a word. Until that last time. Where can we find Doris? She must be in her dressing room. All right, let's go look for Doris. And thanks. You're welcome, Mr. Holmes. Did I show her the silver earring? What else can I tell you? No. Goodbye, miss, and thanks. You're welcome, Mr. Holmes. Pod. Working people not allow acts as their peace and quiet. They walk through here as if it were a common thoroughfare. Nothing strange about that. They still haven't bothered to change locks. Anyone can enter it well and abuse me. Me, me, who in the 50s, I was rather good actually. Did you see me with the best? Me, and they just treat me as, oh. Are you uh, rehearsing? Everyone has his own technique. Cheers! Miss Small told you about your earring. Would you mind showing it to us? It can't be sold. Do you think that actors have no heart? I would prefer dying of thirst than parting with it. My friend, my best friend Veronica, who I love like my own daughter, she gave it to me, my little Veronica. 
Do you know what has happened to your friend? Left. She left with that Jeffreys. Oh, I know what they say. That Richard's murdered them both. Why not? He did everything for them. Everything! She was naught but a common flower girl. And that Jeffreys was a mean servant. He made them actors. Yes, actors. Yes. Mm -hmm. All right. Goodbye. We'd better leave you to your work. I mean, uh, rehearsal. Hmm. Ouch! I need to concentrate. <laughs> All right. It doesn't need look like I can grab anything from over here. Or look at any of the wigs or the costumes. We are in the backstage area. This leads back here. What about this way? All right. What chaos! Through the flying dragons of the Virgin Islands, the land of gargantuan man-eating crabs, love in the heart of the Black Desert. Hmm, this author seems to be particularly inept. Through the flight of the... Yeah, okay, we uh, listen to that. These items are poorly made. Observe the antique armor as mere painted relief. These items are. These items are. Do I just need to look at the documents we grabbed, or? No, I. Mm. Through the flapper. I don't know why we switched to Watson here. Okay, we definitely grabbed something that time. Guacayamo. This road is the only sure way to reach Guacayamo, the town of Paris. Indeed, the branch of the Amazon where the town is situated is impassable due to the rapids. Many explorers have capsized there and were likely eaten by piranhas as their bodies were never found. Even the native Indians from the nearby jungle refused to try these rapids. Instead, they employed their sturdy boats for sedentary fishing. Their ancestral mode of fishing is quite original. They use primitive spears to harpoon big fish while they watch from their dugouts. They conduct elaborate ceremonies to invoke the power of their gods before fishing or hunting and have much success with it. I don't know whether these gods exist, but the savages are inconstant, incontestable archers. You should look after yourself so as to not, to, uh, not to offend them, if you wish to negotiate with them. Certain tribal members are more sociable than the rest. They are agreeable to offer tobacco, some weapon, or incredible handmade objects in trade. These magnificent crafted items are often adorned with splendid green parrot feathers in, order, in honor of the conquistadors who named this town. You can also acquire leather goods made from the silky skin of the arboreal monkeys which are hunted in this region. This leather is comparable to the touch of the finest silk and is unique in all the world. Unfortunately, as in many other cases, there are those unscrupulous people who manage to give the taste of alcohol to these native populations. This poses a substantial threat to these small tribes in their future. There is also the steady arrival of gold prospectors and adventurers who have chopped down their forests and made the Indians more aggressive. Some of my guides have clearly suggested that this primitive but picturesque culture but will but one day end in a bloody bath. A little white savior-ish, but... Through the flying... Um, 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 um. All right, let's step back out, I guess. I really don't.
don't know why we got uh, Watson in control there. I don't think it makes any goddamn sense, but... Who is it? Mr. Richards, my name is Sherlock Holmes. You may put away your knife. Rest assured, I am indeed Sherlock Holmes. Thank you for receiving us, Mr. Richards. Would you mind if I asked you a few questions? I will answer your questions, Mr. Holmes, only because I have heard about you. Would you tell me about Sir Bromsby? I will not lie to you, I hated Bromsby. He is the cause of all my troubles, I swear. I have often dreamed of killing Bromsby with my own two hands, but I didn't kill him. Do you know an Asian named Wong Jie? What would he be doing there? Well, in the days of the Fairfax Theatre, I once employed a Chinese fellow who went by that name. However, I was forced to dismiss him because he was a great deal of trouble, and I've never seen him since that time. You retain several keys from the Fairfax Theatre, don't you? Well, I don't understand the purpose of your questions, but yes, there were indeed two keys for the Fairfax Theatre main door. When the bank took possession, we gave only one of them to Bromsby's assistant. When asked, we lied and said there was only one key. But why? Well, we kept the other one out of spite. We had thoughts of returning in the night and wreaking havoc, but we had no opportunity as we left for abroad after the transfer to go on our tour. I suppose the key may have been lost somewhere along our travels. About the disappearance of Miss Davenport. I don't know why you want to talk about it. Does some vile curiosity cause you to torment me in this way? Thank you, Mr. Rich. It is I should reveal. Oh, this can't be possible. How did you come by this? Dear God, if only someone like yourself had been present that evening. Oh, now you want to talk about it, huh? Please tell us what's happened. That night, after the performance, I left to stroll alone along the riverbank. The next morning, I had barely returned when I was seized by two local policemen and led to a prison cell for interrogation. Why? When I got there, an Englishman, the local chief of police, told me that a deserted boat had been discovered along the opposite bank of the river. Inside the boat, I found a star covered with blood. It belonged to Veronica, who had vanished, along with my other partner, Jeffries. And then what happened? No one could prove my innocence, but they also found no proof of my complicity in these events, nor had they found any bodies. Tell us a little more about your partners. I had met Jeffries while on tour. He was just a young tramp drunkard. Whatever my feelings were then, I feel no pity for him now. He betrayed me. But it wasn't the same with Veronica. I fear the pain caused by these events will forever haunt me. Thank you, Mr. Richards. It is nothing, Mr. Holmes. This man is a wonderful actor. Maybe, Watson. Maybe. There is one more thing we need to do here. Oh, here. Maybe I grabbed something? Ah, it was in my inventory. A set of costumes. There are 30 listed. But I count only 29. Yes, the artillery officer uniform is missing. Huh. I wonder why that is. Let's go backstage now. May I 
ask you a few questions. It all depends on what you're asking. What are you doing? My job, my lord. I'm making this jumble look a bit neater. Could you tell me what happened in Brazil? Yes, my lord, I was there when it happened. But Mr. Richards takes it very personally if we chat about those times. And I won't risk my position without some consideration, if you get my meaning. Here's five guineas. How's that? Oh, my lord, you're too kind. I don't really know much of what happened. You see, I was alone at a tavern that night, and I was, as one could say, very fond of the local alcohol. When I returned to our lodgings, I learned that the actress and the costumier had taken to their heels. And what did you do then? I made my way to the inn with all haste to learn what they'd taken in their sudden departure. You must understand my position. I was solely responsible for the security of the luggage and troop properties. Can you then imagine my surprise when I saw that nothing was missing? Absolutely nothing. They hadn't even taken their personal items. I can understand that of a man like Jeffreys, but it was most unusual for a lady such as Miss Veronica. So the idea came to me that perhaps they hadn't truly left, you see. And what of Dwight Richards? I learned that Mr Richards had been seized by the local authorities. It seemed he was under suspicion for the murder of the missing lovers. This was too incredible. And then there's another odd thing that weighs on my mind. When we finally returned to England, Mr. Richards asked me to do him a small personal service. What was strange was that he insisted I keep the matter confidential and not read a word of it to anyone. What kind of service? Well, there's a small room with an iron door located above the backstage. It was used to store the stage lights and fireworks. He asked me to help him move all of Miss Veronica's personal belongings to the room. Every little thing, without exception. Her large truck, her dresses, all of it. Where is this room? The end of the passage, but there is one difficulty. You see, Mr. Richards has the only key to the room's iron door, because only he has a complete set of keys to this building. All right. Goodbye, my friend. My respects, my lord. Oh, just to double check. Okay, that's the lock key. That lock room. Okay. isn't she? Do you have a complete set of keys to the theatre? Oh, yes. Take them. But you will see to their safe return. He hasn't even asked me what I'm gonna do with them. It was just like, yeah, here, take the keys. No worries. if Richards arrives. All right, Holmes. Let us see whether we can find other evidence. A gift from the go- I need something. I need something. Uh, I guess I need to maybe examine it with a magnifying glass. Nice pattern made of encrusted nacre. What does it I see? To open the safe, I must have the two other earrings. Hmm. This lock has never been forced. All right. Uh, anything else in this lock room? Maybe something I behind. I have no interest in. Nope. That is of no. Okay. No, it's literally just the. Uh, event. Literally just uh, the little safe. Okay, let's uh let's go get uh, the other two earrings from people. Uh huh.
probably cannot take her earring. Hmm. Let me talk to the other actors. I should show her one of them. Oh my stars! Would you mind lending me your earring? I shall give it back to you in a few moments. Certainly. Maybe you would like to borrow Doris's earring as well. I don't believe she would give it to you, but to me, certainly. If you wait here, I will get it for you. All right. So kind. I need to use the keys. Watson, stay there and inform me if Richards arrives. All right, Holmes. It is elementary. Descriptions of exotic landscapes. Nothing of interest. Richards and Miss Davenport standing in front of the old Fairfax Theatre. But who is this third man? Well, well, gentlemen, you arrive at precisely the right moment. Is your good mood a sign that you have found something of interest? Absolutely, Holmes. It seems to me I caught the right end this time. What? Really? We learn about it only by chance. It appears that at one o'clock this morning, Grimble arranged for his solicitors to send his demands to the court for the appropriation of Bromsby Enterprises. My men will spare nothing in their search for the elusive Grimble. Lestrade, pray continue. Then I followed your advice and we advanced further into our investigation of Mr. Richards. Did you know that his true name is Gaetano Riccardino? As this, Mr. Riccardino, at age 19, he was sentenced to two years imprisonment for armed robbery of a fair store. And who would you think the complainant was in this case? In truth, a certain Melvin Bromsby. This new evidence of his criminal past makes him another principal suspect in these murders. Very interesting. Any other findings? It would seem that Grimble and Richards are old associates. They were both intimately involved in the sale and transfer of the Fairfax Theatre. These two make quite a pair, don't you agree? Well, Lestrade, I'll keep my thoughts on these matters secret for the moment. Ah, you're not playing according to Hoyle. Really, Holmes, you must at least tell me your opinions on Richards. Mr. Richards is an intelligent person. He is a man of great personal resources. If I had the power of Scotland Yard at my disposal, I would take all steps necessary to ensure that Mr. Richards is secure within a prison cell. And the sooner the better for all concerned. When the case involves murder, it is not wise to underestimate any possibilities. You are a good man, Holmes. I swear upon my name that within the space of an hour, our friend Mr. Richards will be warming a cold cell at Dartmoor. Very well, my friend. By the way, I would like to see you tomorrow at Sheringford Hall to discuss in greater detail some of the more puzzling elements of this case. Can I expect you? I would not miss it for the world. This is most fortuitous, as Miss Bromsby also invited me to the hall. I was told they had good news to share, and it seems to me an engagement announcement must be at hand. So, we shall see you tomorrow. Let us return to Baker Street. Isn't it nice how Lestrade right? this case does thinks to have everything wrong. settled? There is but one piece missing that I need to complete this puzzle. You know, it's not very important from the criminal point of view, but from the economic aspects of this case, it is essential. Regarding the question of whether Lestrade is correct, I will give you two items that should provide the answer that you seek. The first is a table representing the shoe sizes of the main characters in this case. Examine it carefully, Watson. A parcel for you, Mr. Holmes. Ah, this would be Mycroft. 
Here is the final piece, which completes our puzzle, Watson. Would this be the second element? What second element? You have just said that in order to determine if Lestrade is correct, I would need to consider two items. You told me about the shoe sizes, and I ask if this news article is the second clue. Oh, no account. The second clue is a question, a very simple question. The answer will take the grass under the feet of several English citizens. For if they cannot even guess the answer to this question, they are for the gallows. The question is as follows. Watson, do you think that Horace Fowler slept with a cushion? It seems to me that we have gathered all of the key elements. What the question should... He's just showing off at the point. So, let's see, a couple of last few documents. Perfect theater for people. Jeff is probably the last one. Raymond Waters. Early in the morning, the lifeless body of Mr. Raymond Waters, a well-known engineer, was found on the lane to the market district. At an early point in the investigation, it was found that a brawl was the cause of this unfortunate demise. The date of funeral services have not yet been announced. All of the men of she says approximately 7 except the following. Sir Bromsby and Johansson, 10. Coacher Lamb, Lieutenant Harrington, 9. Conlon Patterson, Horace Fallot, 6. Miss Bromsby, Miss Lambert, 4. Desperate message. This was found inside the thing. I can't believe that she would take it all back. Everything cannot be finished between us. Let us meet tonight, I beg you. Alright, time for the quiz. Are there several sets of keys from the Ashton Theater? Yes. Uh, did one of the actresses lose a red-haired wig? Yes. Um, it's... Oh. That's definitely... No, yeah, Bruce Estimus is correct. Uh, Miss Sullivan, I think? Yep. Could the discovery in the dressing room be connected to the cave? Probably. Uh. Bu -bu 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 -bu. Writing on the message found in the earring safe box can respond to the writing of the missing card in Luther the Monsieur Gear. And uniform of artillery officer is missing. The writing on the message to writing of Davenport is found elsewhere. Yes. As we just learned, it's going to be both on the Antiques Dealer and French Visit Card. We must have made the uh, question. That's probably the first one. I uh, probably need to use the testimony of the. This guy. We must. The question should be answered yes. What did he say? Only he has a complete set of keys. Okay. One of the actresses lost her right wig. Probably this one that's off. Oh, I see. Uh -huh. This one is tricky. Boom. The button found in the kitchen at the murder must correspond to the uniform gear to the roster. The question should be answered yes or Um. This too. Yep. And this is the yes, because Bruce Aston has it. It is simplicity itself, Watson. We have answered all the questions. All right, congratulations! You've successfully completed your investigation. The following questions are optional, and you do not have to answer them correctly to reach the last step of the game. Who killed Sir Bromsby?
I don't want to spoil it. Because I know the answers to all of these. Proceed to the final movie. It's like, it feels unfair to answer the final who done it when I know the answers. Mr. Holmes, Dr. Watson, I feel relieved that everything is settled. The inspector told me that you were not as useful as you had hoped in this case, but you did your best, and I am grateful to you. Dear Lestrade, well, the inspector deliberately minimized my role in this matter so that I could reveal a secret to you. I wish James, I mean, Lieutenant Harrington could be here now, but... He had to leave for London on a very urgent business. But how could you know? It is my business to know, Miss Bromsby. Thus, I am able to tell you about the case of the silver earring. Everything begins on that sad afternoon which was to celebrate your birthday and ended with the untimely death of your father. Miss Bromsby, you did not murder your father. I kissed your hand that day and did not detect even the slightest smell of gunpowder. I also discovered powder traces that proved the shot was fired from behind the second side door. You were not seen at that door. But where did the murderer go after taking his shot? Everyone who tried to exit through the side entrance found it blocked. According to witnesses and other evidence, none of the guests could have possibly been the murderer because they were all present in the ballroom. No one left through the service door and traces confirm that no one could have fled by using the staircase. The windows in the kitchen, as elsewhere in the manor, were appointed with thick bars, thus they offered no escape. So did he vanish into thin air? In fact, one of the parties did leave the ballroom and went to the kitchen corridor. He left to meet his accomplice, who was not an invited guest. This accomplice was a professional actor who was disguised to resemble our missing invitee. This guest hid under voile in the shadow of a statue and waited for his moment. Meanwhile, his twin acted out his part in the ballroom and provided the murderer with a perfect alibi. When the killer heard the applause, he left his hiding place, aimed, took his shot and hit his target. It is important to know that the actor was well placed at the manor. He secured entry to the manor by impersonating a French head waiter. Using his position, he persuaded those in charge to use long tablecloths and to arrange the tables in a most peculiar manner. When the shooting occurred, our actor joined the crowd and rapidly crept across the room, concealed under the tables. As he neared the side door, he rose from beneath the last table and acted as if he had been jostled and fallen. However, as he stood, he accidentally snagged a small piece of his dirty glove upon a chair. When he arrived at the door, which was held closed by the murderer, he tapped on it using a prearranged code and was allowed entry. He exited to the corridor while his partner continued to hold the door shut against all others. The actor discarded his disguise in the deep kitchen well, helped himself to two bottles of excellent whiskey and quietly went outside. The assassin waited several minutes. Then, in the last seconds of the confusion, he returned to the ballroom. Thus, we have the crime committed by an individual whom everyone swears was in the room when the shot was fired. But this agrees with my conclusions. Richard is an actor, and everyone swears that Grimble was in the room. I didn't consider the course of events as you described, Holmes, but admit it, our deductions agree. Moreover, both of these suspects are similar in size and manner. Your theory presumes that Grimble is an excellent shot, which is false. It also takes on faith that Sir Bromsby had discovered the misappropriations, supplying Grimble his motive, but irrefutable proof that neither Grimble nor Richards were guilty waited at Horace Fowlett's, the matter of his pillow. But there was no pillow at Horace Fowlett's. Precisely. Mr. Fowlett slept with one. When I arrived at his home, I believed him already dead. Therefore, the news of his hasty departure came as no surprise. From the evidence obtained at his home and the statements of his neighbour, I learned the following. On the evening of his death, Mr. Fowlett was visited by a man who desired to sell him some exotic trifle. While this man distracted Mr. Fowlett, a second man quietly crept into the house and tried to open his safe. This individual was well acquainted with the house and the location of the safe. But when he failed to open it, 
he most likely became enraged and killed Mr. Fowlett. This individual, Miss Bromsby, was your cousin, Wyatt Collins, who returned to England under the name Johansson. But what about this pillow? Mr. Fowlett's pillow had vanished. Later, Dr. Watson discovered a feather from the pillow in the train compartment used by the man who impersonated Fowlett. But why did Fowlett's impersonator take the pillow, and why didn't the station manager notice it? Mr. Fowlett was short, but very portly. In order to imitate him, the man used the pillow to create the appearance of a stouter man. There is no other explanation. This man was a much leaner man than Mr. Fowlett, Mr. Grimble, or Mr. Richards. Then, Holmes, who did murder Sir Bromsby? And for what reason? You'll see, Lestrade, when it's a question of multiple murders, except for the deviant ones, there are two primary motives, revenge and greed. Wyatt Collins' presence at Fowlett's tells us his motive was about Bromsby's wealth. He went there for the express purpose of stealing the will so that he would receive at least a portion of Bromsby's estate. If his uncle had died with no will found, Collins would have been entitled to a share of the inheritance under English law. But if my cousin failed in his attempt and the evidence clears my name, though I am to inherit, why were my father and cousin murdered? Besides, tomorrow I am to announce my engagement and will be married soon. Holmes, hold About on. that? There's a flaw in your reasoning. There is only one key for the door to the cement factory and Grimble is the only person known to have it. So he must be directly involved in the murder of Johansson. I mean Collins. Is that true, Lestrade? Mr. Richards told me that there was indeed a second key which was lost. And have you forgotten the murder of the barman hunter? A young man without any criminal record whose sole interests were painting and flowers. Why was he murdered in cold blood with no signs of forcible entry or theft at his lodgings? Simply put, he was killed because he was present when your father was murdered. But why Hunter? What did he see or hear? And above all, how did he acquire the earring of Miss Veronica Davenport, the leading actress of the Fairfax Theatre and Dwight Richard's mistress? I can stand this no more. My thoughts are dazed. Will you finally reveal who murdered my father? The murderer? Here he comes now. I understand your feelings of incredulity, but I have never been more serious. You must know that the first person who enters this room is the murderer of your father, Miss Bromsby, and I will provide irrefutable proof of their guilt. Da da da! Well, good afternoon, gentlemen. You made the right choice to leave London. It is unbearably foggy. But Lavinia, darling, what's going on? She knows. But how? I, I mean, what? W what does she know? I don't understand. Whatever do you mean? Oh, no. You understand me clearly, Mr. Harrington. And you also, Spencer. Or should I say, Mr. Jeffries? Ba -ba -ba! Yourself, Mr. What a monstrous misunderstanding. Oh, I've just explained myself to Miss Bromsby about the truth of her father's murder. But I can tell the story again from the very beginning. It begins several years ago. Wyatt Collins, the nephew of Mr. Bromsby, is forced by his uncle to leave England for South America. His hatred is fostered by the ingratitude he perceives in Sir Bromsby. Wasn't his uncle's career financed by his mother's money? In Collins' mind, Melvin Bromsby owes him an eternal debt of gratitude and was thus obliged to finance Collins' indolent lifestyle, fulfilling his every need. Here is our first criminal, Wyatt Collins. Then we have you, Mr. Harrington. You were a brilliant student at the Military Academy and are an excellent shot, are you not? You were the only person at the reception with sufficient skills to make the shot that took Sir Bromsby's life. During my investigation, I learned that ex-officers of Her Majesty's Army enjoy great favour around the world for administrative positions. You left India and made your way to Brazil <laughs> where you obtained the position as warden of the prison in Guacayamo. Do not try to deny your presence there. The pictures in your hunting portfolio could have been taken nowhere else in the world except Guacayamo. We now have our second criminal, Lieutenant Harrington. Mr. Jeffries, your arrival in Guacayamo set things in motion. The theatre company had come to Brazil as part of their worldwide tour. You had been involved with the lovely Veronica Davenport and loved her with a passionate yet possessive love. 
However, Miss Davenport did not share your affections. She had, in fact, tried several times to end your affair prior to the company's arrival in Guachiamo. It seems she was truly devoted to Dwight Richards and would never leave him. After you arrived, you frequented the town's bawdier spots. This is where you first met Mr. Harrington, and you quickly became close companions. It seems tedium and heartbreak do bring certain people together. After the performance, maddened by alcohol and grief, you killed Miss Davenport because she had rejected your love. You then fled to your newfound friend, the Warden, to confess your crime and beg for his help. In a show of friendship, he helped dispose of her corpse and directed suspicions towards your rival, Dwight Richards. Afterwards, you lay low, leaving the others to believe that you had been killed or had gone missing. You stayed hidden until they had departed, and you must have kept Miss Davenport's earring as some morbid souvenir. No doubt you also retained not only the key to the Fairfax Theatre, but the keys from Aston's, where you had been employed several years earlier. Here, then, is our third felon, Mr. Jeffries. Life was difficult in Brazil for our trio. Mr. Jeffries rarely went out, Mr. Harrington's men were talking behind his back, and Mr. Collins' funds were inadequate. One evening, Colin spoke of his cousin, who, in a few months' time, was to return to England from finishing school. She was also the sole heir to one of the greatest fortunes in England. Imagine these three men, besotted with alcohol, considering the wealth that would one day pass to this slip of a girl. A terrible plan was devised. Several days later, they left for England, false papers for two of their party in hand, resolved to seize a portion, if not all, of this great inheritance. Incredible! Yes, incredible, and horribly true. At first, their plan was to forge a duplicate will or destroy the original so that Mr. Collins would receive a share of the estate. This would happen soon enough, as they would murder Sir Bromsby at his daughter's birthday reception. It was essential that Collins enter the country under false papers, so that neither his uncle nor the authorities would be alerted to his presence in England. This would avoid any suspicion attaching him for his uncle's death when he arrived to claim his inheritance. They quickly put their plans into effect. Mr. Jeffries arrived at the household in the guise of a stylish French head waiter and studied the lay of the manor. Mr. Harrington, the assassin, would accompany a person with rather poor eyesight to the reception so that the illusion of the fake Mr. Harrington would go unchallenged. As the head waiter, Jeffries was in a unique position to study the guest list. He quickly learned that two of the guests, Miss Roundtree and Colonel Patterson, had both poor eyesight and were unaccompanied. Lieutenant Harrington was quite busy in the days before the reception. He courted Miss Roundtree with great dedication and made fast friends with the Colonel. He hoped to secure one, if not two, invitations to the reception. Your arrival as the Colonel's guest was your first error, Harrington. Is it credible that a young officer who left the army because of his hatred towards all military authority would easily befriend a man who embodies everything that he detests? But your efforts bore fruit and you obtained your invitation. Mr. Jeffries, as head waiter, took great care that the tables and table clothes were arranged specifically to accommodate their schemes. Mr. Jeffries then secured the disguise for his role as the false Lieutenant Harrington. He remembered that an officer's uniform, similar to Lieutenant Harrington's, and a red wig, identical to the colouring of the Lieutenant's hair, were in storage at the Fairfax Theatre. He learned that the company had taken up residence at the site of the old Aston Theatre, for which he still had the key. It was therefore a simple matter for him to acquire these items for his masquerade. They now only lacked the will, which Mr. Collins presumed was kept at Flowlet's house. Their plan was to take these papers prior to the murder of Sir Bromsby, so that Flowlet would be unaware of either their presence or substitution until it was too late. But things went badly. Mr. Jeffries tried to divert Mr. Flowlet. But he must have been alerted by some noise, as Collins struggled vainly to open the safe. Upon being discovered, Collins killed Fowlett on the spot. The two conspirators then left the house in such a way that witnesses believed it was Fowlett himself who had left. They would now have to find another way to get hold of the money, because no doubt Sir Bromsby had disinherited Collins in favour of his daughter. They decided to take the money from his daughter, a young, naive and vulnerable young woman. 
On the day of reception, Oof, Mr. That hurts. Benson arrived with Jeffers, disguised as his servant Spencer and the Colonel. With the promise of whiskey, Jeffries easily secured the unwitting aid of two fellow servants and assumed a position at the service door. He wagered that he could pinch two or three good bottles of liquor from the kitchen if his companions would cover for him. I have just explained what happened next. After the shooting, he took two bottles of excellent whiskey. Only someone knowledgeable would have taken these two bottles over the others and Mr. Jeffries had been formerly employed at a luxurious hotel in France. Upon his return, he gave an accounting to his fellow servants, did his hair, and left the manor. The promised delivery of the liquor and his frightened look secured the two men's cooperation in providing his alibi. They could not have known his true role in these events. The one problem for the conspirators was the barman, Simon Hunter. He had perfect eyesight, unlike the colonel, and realized that the man who claimed to be near the bar at the time of the murder had in fact lied. He hinted as much to Mr. Harrington and most certainly intended blackmail. As they were short on funds, the accomplices gave him Miss Davenport's earring as collateral and pledged to return with the money he demanded. That night, when Lieutenant Harrington visited us in London, he had just come from Simon Hunter's. Hunter had told Harrington that the earring had been pawned and he would not reveal the name of the shop unless Harrington paid him his money. Mr. Harrington ruthlessly killed Hunter and the earring so precious to Mr. Jeffries was lost. Earlier that morning, Jeffries lured Collins to the cement factory on the pretext of fabricating false evidence against Grimble. But they no longer needed Collins to acquire the bronze be fortune. Mr. Harrington would wed the young heiress, then... Birth is split between they two to between three, huh? Death ...and they would take it all. So Mr. Jeffries murdered Collins and made sure his body was barely recognizable. If he was identified, it would not affect their plans, as they believed leaving the corpse at the cement factory would direct suspicion towards Grimble. When Mr. Harrington came to see us, he learned we were hot on Collins' trail and had traced his movements up to the factory. He assumed he would go there within the hour and left to quickly round up his associates and devise a plan. Jeffries, from his days at the Fairfax Theatre, knew an Asian of questionable talents who had no visible ties with this case and could attack us without drawing suspicion their way. We avoided this attack and from that moment I was convinced of Lieutenant Harrington's involvement in the conspiracy. The last elements of proof were revealed at the Vagrant's Camp near the monastery outside of London. Mr. Jeffries had tramped through England in his past and might have thought to hide Collins in the forest near the Richmond's Abbey. The very day that I was there, he tried to destroy all evidence of Collins' murder. Fortunately, he did not manage to destroy everything. It seems Collins, foreseeing his possible death, left a small surprise for his accomplices. It would be easily missed except by someone who observes all and misses nothing. But this is merely some draft to lull us to sleep, Mr. Holmes. Lavinia, surely you can't believe these mad accusations. They arise from nothing. What proof do you offer for what you say? None. Believe what you will, Mr. Harrington. I will warn you that Mr. Collins left a letter written in his own hand, which named yourself and Mr. Jeffries and accused you both of complicity in the murder of his uncle. At this very moment, Inspector Lestrade's men are conducting a search of your rooms. They will find the evidence that when added to the accusations within this letter will prove your guilt beyond all doubt. The Chiripatwi cigarettes, your portfolio, as well as a feather from the pillow which was taken from Horace Fowlett's, these items prove my deductions. I suggest we wait here for their arrival with these proofs, and I assure you our wait will be brief. Bravo, Mr. Holmes. Well done. Accept my apologies, my dear Lavinia. I think under the circumstances it would be best if we postponed our engagement. I'm sorry for your father, but what do you expect? We had to give it our best shot. Oh. Where is the earring now? You will tell me where is it? Unless you tell me at once where the earring is, no one will leave this room alive. Don't you understand? You are all going to die. They are all yours, Lestrade. I suggest you return with your agents to London as soon as possible. Thank you, Mr. Grimble, for literally applying my precepts. Watson, 
Let us escort Miss Bromsby to her rooms. She will need her rest. All right. Finally, the conclusion. Collins never named either Harrington or Jeffreys in his letter. Indeed, Watson. But they could not have known. I played my bluff, and they believed me. And Grimble, where did he appear from? You can now boast that one of the most influential men in England served as your driver. Since my visit to Fowlett's, I knew that Grimble had nothing to do with this crime. Yeah. I asked him to assist with the investigation, and it was at my request that he took steps to acquire Bromsby Enterprises. He gained us precious time by forcing Harrington and Jeffreys to wait and see if Miss Bromsby would inherit. He ran quite a risk in doing me this favour, because their plots then turned against him. I also asked him to send the letter which lured the two murderers away from the hall. I needed a moment to explain everything to Miss Lavinia. It would be dreadful if she fell into the hands of her father's killer. From the beginning, Grimble was concerned only with saving her inheritance. He never once doubted her innocence. Nevertheless, didn't he misappropriate those funds? Indeed, but not for his own profit. It was solely to protect his friend Bromsby. An ex-architect with whom he had quarrelled, a Mr Waters, had contacted Sir Bromsby before this intrigue began. Waters learned from Captain Bowie that Sir Bromsby had encouraged certain actions against workers hired to build a bridge in India. That project was the bridge over the Kalidasa Abyss. Waters blackmailed Bromsby from afar. Grimble received the letters and considered them to be quite serious. He knew his hot-tempered friend well and preferred to conceal the blackmail attempt for fear of disastrous consequences. So Grimble made regular payments to Waters in exchange for his silence. Unfortunately, Collins discovered the arrangement while he was working at the cement factory and threatened to reveal everything. Grimble could not afford for that to occur. He managed to rid himself of Collins by sending him to Fowlett. Then it was Bromsby's turn to discover the blackmail by sheer accident. He was angered, but before he could decide his next move, Mr. Waters died suddenly and removed all threat. When Grimble learned that Waters had died, he confessed all to Bromsby. He noted that the money paid was a pittance when measured against Bromsby Enterprises and that the same amount could now be applied in other ways. India had enriched them so greatly and Bromsby had been cursed over the harm done to the Indian people in his employment. It was decided that these same funds would now be sent on a monthly basis to a Bombay orphanage in the care of a Sergeant Brahamai. It is possible that Bromsby intended to increase his patronage and this was the important news he intended to reveal to the press at his daughter's reception. It was she who had harshly reproached him regarding his behaviour towards the Indians in his employ. Do you remember the words from that poem which he had written into his notes? It said that the ungrateful always die miserably. Indeed, Holmes. But there is one thing that I still don't understand. Why did you ask Lestrade to put Richards behind bars? He wasn't guilty of any crime, but you treated him as a murderer. I advised Lestrade that it would be prudent to place Richards in custody so we could protect him from harm. Mr. Richards is a wise and intelligent man. He would have recognised Harrington and Jeffreys on sight. When he realised that Jeffreys was alive and that I possessed the missing earring, he would have drawn the same conclusions as I. So this investigation would have been stopped cold by one or two more murders. I see. Well, Watson, you seem to know everything. Tell me, please, that small missive which I can see on the desk. It contains two invitations to the opera's opening night, does it not? If so, we shall finally have our opportunity to hear this marvellous soprano. Well, what do you say, Watson? Bravo. <laughs> Bravo. I just love... This voice actor's version of poems. He's he's really good at it, I find. Let's enjoy this music one last time.
all royalty free music, as you can tell. I wonder if this was the first major game from Frogwares. All right, um, and that will do it for Sherlock Holmes, the case of the silver earring. We'll be back in about a couple weeks, Wednesday in two weeks, uh, with the start of the longest journey. Um, like I said, this before next week. Uh, I will stream Monday, but then I'll be off uh, for a week on a little bit of a vacation. So uh, thank you for watching, and uh, until next time.